Americans have struggled with the concept of birth control since the country's early days for moral and ethical reasons alike. Whether it be religious doctrines or the boundaries of privacy, birth control in America has a long history of debate that has continued to this day. Birth control is not a new concept. In the Middle Ages, women wore weasel testicles on their thighs or its severed foot around their necks. Some women believed that pregnancy could be prevented by walking in circles three times around a spot where a pregnant wolf had urinated. Even as recently as the 1950s, practices such as withdrawal were believed to be very effective. The progression of contraception in the United States has made huge strides, but not without struggle. On March 3, 1873, Congress passed the Comstock Act, or the Anti-Obscenity Act, which stated that birth control methods were obscene and illicit and made it illegal to disseminate contraception through the Postal Service or across state lines. During this time period, America was the only Western nation that had criminalized contraception. Most Americans supported the Comstock Act, which was championed by Anthony Comstock, a devout Christian man who was deeply disturbed by the expressed sexuality he saw in New York City. The Comstock Act and many state laws that reinforced it remained unchallenged for decades, until a woman finally stood up and took a stand. Margaret Sanger was born in 1879 to a family of 11 children. Her mother suffered seven miscarriages and died at 50 years old due to complications with tuberculosis. Sanger believed that her mother's untimely death could have been prevented had she been able to prevent the excessive pregnancies that had weakened her body. After studying to be a nurse, Sanger turned her attention to family planning and birth control. She opened the first family planning clinic in Brooklyn, New York in 1916. The clinic was promptly shut down 10 days after it had been opened, but the effect was irreversible. Sanger showed the public the possibilities and created a door that could never be shut. In 1921, Sanger founded the American Birth Control League, which would later be known as the Planned Parenthood Federation of America. The goal of Planned Parenthood was to teach women how to plan their families and protect themselves from unwanted pregnancies by use of abstinence or alternative contraceptive methods. In 1930, the Anglican bishop approved limited use of birth control for churchgoers, which aided the Anglican community in their personal decisions. On the other hand, the Catholic Pope, Pius XI, continued preaching against contraception. The effect of the Church's teachings divided many individuals between contraception and morality, because it seemed that one could not be had without the loss of the other. It was an incredibly confusing time for many women, but the American Birth Control League did manage to hang on and spread the word about sexual protection. In 1938, the Comstock Act was repealed. It was no longer a federal offense to use birth control. However, many states still had strict laws in place regarding the legality of contraception. In Connecticut, the use of birth control was prohibited, while in Mississippi, even speaking about using contraception was punishable by law. Federally, yes, there was no restriction on the use of birth control, but women were still very much bound by state laws. Margaret Sanger pushed for new methods of contraception as well. After founding the American Birth Control League, Sanger reached out to Catherine McCormick, a wealthy heiress who believed in the development of safe and effective means of birth control. With funding by McCormick, Sanger pushed biochemist Gregory Pincus and gynecologist John Roth to research the use of hormones as a birth control method. In 1954, the researchers conducted the first human pill trial in Massachusetts. Fifty women were given sample pills in which synthetic progesterone and estrogen were used to repress ovulation. The study proved to be a success, and on May 9, 1960, the FDA approved Enavoid as the United States' first oral contraception method. With these new methods of birth control came much controversy, which made its way to the Supreme Court in 1965. Estelle Griswold was the executive director of the Planned Parenthood League in Connecticut. In 1965, she and Dr. C. Lee Buxton were found guilty of providing contraception to married women, which was illegal under Connecticut law. The case was brought to the Supreme Court under the claim that the law was unconstitutional. The decision stated that the state's ban on the use of contraceptives violated the right of marital privacy and was therefore unconstitutional. The right to privacy was argued by the use of the 14th Amendment, and the state of Connecticut was told that they were to prove that the law was absolutely necessary. This came to be known as the strict scrutiny test. Connecticut failed to prove the necessity of the law, and the Supreme Court promptly struck down the law. Griswold versus Connecticut was incredibly important in not only that it provided legal birth control to married couples, but in the ruling it provided of substantive rights. These rights exist in non-economic areas of daily life, such as the right to privacy, which includes any decisions a person makes regarding their sexual health and contraception. Substantive rights came into play in two very important court cases in the early 1970s, the first of which was Eisenstadt versus Bard. In 1972, 
Apollet William Barr was convicted of handing out pamphlets on contraception and for giving a woman ECMO vaginal foam at the end of a speech he gave in Massachusetts. Massachusetts law made it legal for anyone to give away a drug, medicine, or article on the prevention of pregnancy. Barr challenged this law on the basis of Griswold v. Connecticut, which stated that the Massachusetts law challenged its fundamental human rights. The court ruled in favor of Barr, stating that the law violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. This case was incredibly important because it made birth control a safe and legal means for anyone to use, not just married women. One of the most notable cases regarding birth control took place in 1973 when Norma L. McCorvey demanded a safe and clean environment for an abortion she was choosing to have. In Texas, the law stated that abortions were legal except in situations involving rape. McCorvey challenged this law under the name of Jane Roe, which went to the Supreme Court in 1973. The decision in Roe v. Wade ruled that state laws banning abortion of any kind were unconstitutional. The court case set up a system for lawmaking on abortions. States could not interfere with any abortion that was to take place in the first trimester, and the only restrictions that could be enacted during the second trimester were to be based on maternal health. States could not enact abortion laws regarding the life of a fetus until the third trimester of a woman's pregnancy based on the viability of that fetus. Justice Harry Blackman stated that a woman's zone of privacy included access to contraception and abortions. Roe v. Wade was and remains a controversial decision, but there is no doubt that it was a milestone for women and their reproductive choice. Throughout the 1980s, women leaned more towards the use of the birth control pill. Health concerns over the high dosages of hormones in the castles became an issue, which led to the domination of low dosage pills in the 1980s. By this time, over 10.5 million American women were on the pill. Not even 100 years earlier, it was illegal to even discuss the use of contraception, let alone have it as a viable option for family planning. A study on the birth control pill that had been conducted for over 40 years came to a close in 2010. It was found that out of the 46,000 women who were studied, those that were taking the pill lived longer and were less likely to die of all causes, including cancer and heart disease. Today, over 100 million women worldwide are taking the pill, not to mention millions of others who use other forms of contraception. The options for contraception are numerous, from condoms and diaphragms to hormones in pill or patch form. However, none of this would have been possible if people like Margaret Sanger or Estelle Griswold had not have stood up for their beliefs and fought for the rights of others. Regardless of one's personal stance on contraception, the history of birth control in America is rich and strong, and continues on to the present day.